Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Oliver Hassler, who's the chairman and CEO of PYX Resources, who are the second largest producing mineral sands company globally, based on their Zircon Resources, um, on their particularly large operation in Indonesia. Um, Oliver has qualifications in mineral engineering and metallurgy and has a background in natural resources, manufacturing and the industrial sectors. Um, and he's on the podcast today to tell us a little bit more about PYX resources um, and the uh, uh, Zcon sector. So that's welcome, Oliver, to the podcast. How are you doing, Oliver? Good morning, Rob. Good to meet you. And yourself. So um, obviously you're in Hong Kong at the moment and I'm in the UK. Um, so appreciate um, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, um, so, um, so the audience knows a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I'm Oliver Hassler. I'm a Swiss citizen. I uh, grew up in, in Mexico, have worked in many countries in the world. I lived in the UK, in France, in Holland, in Spain, done business in Asia all my life. Like you me mentioned, I'm a material engineer with a master's degree in metallurgy and an MBA. Like every good Swiss, I served one and a half years uh, in the army, and I, I started with Pix Resources three years ago. Okay. Um, what did you can tell us a little bit about the company as well? So a little bit about the history um, and sort of where you are today. Obviously, I've got a number of questions that I want to ask you, but I just wanted to give us a, just a, a broad overview of the, of the business and the company. I'll be happy to answer them, uh, Rob. So we're, like you mentioned at the beginning, we're a mineral uh, sands mining company. It's a very large resource. After the acquisition of our second tenement in February last year, 2021, we became the second largest producing mineral sands company based on Zircon Resources. We listed in Australia in February, 2020, and we recently double listed on the main board of the London Stock Exchange in November uh, last year. Our Mandiri tenement has been in production since 2015. So on one side, we have a very large uh, resource, especially on Zircon. On the other side, we're very well known for our high quality. We have a very high assemblage value of 1,145 dollars per ton, which is three to five times uh, bigger than most of our publicly listed peers. And that is because we are a zircon mine with byproducts of rutal and ilmenite, where most of the mines in the mineral sands uh, arena are ilmenite mines with byproducts of rutal and ilmenite. But we're also uh, looked for by many of the fused zirconia uh, customers, because of our very high quality, we have a low radioactivity. Our uranium plus thorium is under 500 parts per million. We have a low alumina content. And in general, uh, Kalimantan zircon is known for its very high whiteness. And because of these characteristics, the fused zirconia industry likes us. This is the industry that supplies zirconia for high tech applications. I'm not sure if you're aware of, but the Australian government just added uh, zircon and titanium oxide, so rutal and ilmenite, to the list of the 24 critical minerals for the transition into carbon zero. So zircon is used for high-tech applications like solar cells, semiconductors, batteries for electric vehicles, uh, etc. It is a low capex project. We're based, our offices are in Palankaraya, which is the capital city of central Kalimantan, very easy accessible on a flight from Jakarta. Palankaraya was a candidate to become the next capital city of Indonesia. And as a result of that, we have a new airport, hospitals, hotels. We have a government paved road all the way to both of our mines, which we can reach in two hours and one uh, hour respectively. Also, a paved road to our factory and back to both of the major high volume uh, ports. Uh, we have access to the electrical grid, which we're in the process of connecting the factory as we speak. 
There are two very large high volume ports that we're using, Banjamasin and Sampit. They're used for iron to export iron ore, coal and palm oil. So as you can see, our CapEx for logistics, which is a lion's share of the CapEx in this industry is relatively uh, low. Timing for our project could not be better. Uh, on one side, there is, for, for many years, it has been predicted by the industry that there would be a lack of supply for the actual uh, demand. This was delayed by one year since the, uh, as a result of the pandemic. But since February last year, there's a lack of supply in the market, which has triggered very strong price increases. We increased our pricing four times last year, just that you have some numbers to it. In December 2020, we sold at $1,318 per ton. We finished last year at $2,465, and we're selling at over $2,500 per ton. And this is before Chinese New Year. So we still believe that the pressure on prices will continue as China grows. India comes out of the pandemic. There's an empty supply chain towards Europe, which should show a growth uh, uh, as well. In addition to this, the largest uh, mine, Richards Bay, on Rio Tinto in South Africa, closed last year. There is the trade war between Australia, the biggest supplier, China, uh, the biggest off taker, which makes idea, uh, Indonesia ideal. We are a Belt and Road country. We are a strategic uh, partner of China, so they look to do business with for materials with an uh, Indonesian background. So that's as far uh, Rob as an overview. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Appreciate the uh, detailed uh, explanation there. Um, what is your business strategy? And what are you sort of looking to try and achieve? So from the beginning, we've, we focused on increasing our volume. So the first thing we did uh, when we did the IPO in February 2020 was to increase the capacity of our mineral separation plant to 18,000 uh, tons per year. We just expanded that again in November by 33%. And those additional 6,000 tons per year will be used to diversify our product range. We're starting to produce rutile and in the future we will do uh, ilminite. So on one side, it's to increase the volumes. On the other one is to diversify our product range. And also very important now, we're testing a minefield unit in order to re drastically reduce our extraction cost. We, as legacy, we're using third party local contract miners, which are relatively expensive. And by extracting ourselves, we have a huge opportunity of reducing the cost. So that's on the operational side, volume increase, drastic cost reduction and diversifications of product. Strategically, the same way we acquired the second mine, Tisma, in February 2021, I see that we, uh, ourselves as becoming the consolidator of the mineral sands uh, industry in Kalimantan. So we have a very big opportunity in that area of the world. Um so what are your sort of development plans and how can you outline these, uh, obviously, and how these are sort of going to be funded? Originally, we were going to uh, grow only on the Mandiri tenement on the first one. So we were going to use the proceeds from the IPO and the fundraising we did in June last year to grow the capacity in Mandiri and then grow organically. But as I mentioned before, I mean, the, all the stars are aligned for the zircon industry. Timing could not be better. And we're looking into accelerating our growth. So either we continue going like we have been and growing organically uh, into our project, but we're strongly considering to accelerate that, which we would have to fund then from the outside. Today, we have zero debt and uh, any type of growth Today, the projections to grow into 24,000 tons or buy 24,000 tons are relatively low capexes of 25 to $35 million. We are a $500 million, we have a $500 million market cap. So it's rather relatively small investments for uh, the growth we have in this moment in, in time. Um, 
Obviously, um, I, especially on these podcasts, we haven't even we've never covered uh, the Zircon market. So I just wondered if you can tell us a little bit about um, the Zircon market and why it's booming at the moment. So today it's booming because there is a lack of supply uh, for the actual demand. So it's not necessarily because there have been an extra growth. There is just not enough supply in the world. It's it's used for major industry, Circon is used for the ceramic industry, for the foundry industry, for, for refractory, for pigmentations. And the new, the fastest growing industry is high tech, as I mentioned at the beginning, where Zircon is used for semiconductor solar cells and uh, nuclear power plants, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, as a result of this, we're going into, a, as you know, we're going to a commodity super cycle, but I believe this Zircon cycle will be much longer because there aren't, all, if we, even if we add all the projects that are lined up, they probably will not be enough to only cover for the lack of capacity, uh, for the lack of capacity resulting as the older mines go into uh, lower grades, as they lose productivity, as they reach the end of their mine life. So I think this is going to be a very long cycle for Zircon, and there con will continue to be a lot of pressure uh, on prices. It's a very interesting industry because the zircon industry is consolidated. Uh, there's the five main players uh, supply 72% of the global zircon supply. So that brings a lot of discipline uh, into the market. And the same should happen uh, very shortly in uh, with Rutile and Ilmenite. Um, with obviously zircon, where else is zircon found? Uh, predominantly across, I suppose, across the world? The biggest producers by far are yeah. Australia, and mainly Western Australia and South Africa. And then you would find Zircon in several countries in Africa, a little bit in India, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, a little bit in the Americas. And it is known that the future new supply or mines of Zircon, potential supply of Zircon, are in Indonesia, in Kalimantan, where we're the first industrial mining company to, to put foot there. Um, and I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit uh, about the breakdown of your sort of client base, uh, um, obviously where they're located and, and sort of by sector. So since the beginning, it's very clear in our mind that we would need to diversify our customer range. So we have blue chip customers all over the world. We have been in production since 2015. But we make sure that we sell in a diversified customer base around the world in all different regions in the different sectors. And, and now time shows that we did good in doing so. With that, we're protected against crises in different areas of the world and different industry crises. So we, before the pandemic, we sold more in Europe. During and after the pandemic, we're selling more in China. Since a couple of months ago, we started selling in Brazil. So today we sell in China, Indonesia, Taiwan, uh, Japan, India, Germany, in the UK, France, Spain, Brazil, and Mexico. And we want to make sure to keep that mix. Also, we, we like to sell into the high-tech sector. The fused zirconia industry sells over commodity prices uh, because they need our high uh, quality. Um you're moving into sort of the sales of the byproduct, uh, aluminite and rutile. Um, I'm just wondering if you can just give us a little bit more information around that. Sure. We, we obtained last year uh, the, the, the budgeting and operation license to start extraction and production for rutile and ilmenite, which is a byproduct of our process. We're still waiting for the license to export uh, them, but we have started the production of rutile which we're starting to offer in the local market. Since they are byproducts from Zircon, we have absorbed all the cost in the Zircon market. So these are 100% um, margin products, which, which, which obviously are very interesting, not from only from the diversification standpoint, but also as a generator of margin. Both Rutal and, and Ilminite are titanium oxide, so titanium feedstock, so also used for high-tech applications, very important for the future transition towards uh, carbon uh, zero. Interesting. Um, 
do you sort of anticipate any uh, making any further acquisitions um, at all? Obviously, um, and if, obviously, if you're able to provide some of those details, I uh, understand if you're not able to. You know that we're a publicly traded company, so if we would have something on the door, I would not be allowed to tell you that, or I would have to announce it. But I see this as a strategic opportunity and not necessarily a short-term goal. So we're continuously looking for opportunities, but I want to make sure our main goal is to deliver our operational targets, to grow the volume, drastically reduce our cost, and diversify our product range. And then after that, we're continuously looking the day we find something that's interesting and could add value for our shareholders than we do, but we don't feel obliged to do it at a certain moment in time. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the company valuation as well? Yes, I'm, I'm sure you saw the company, the, the shareholders and the market has reacted very well uh, to the news in, in our company. Uh, we have more than fourfold at the share price which since we did the the ipo in february 2020 uh, the, the acquisition of tisma was very well received again by almost doubling the share price and we today we have a 350 million pounds company uh, after we listed on the on the london stock exchange we believed the, and the reason we went to the london stock exchange is because london is a very strong mining a market, the, the shareholders and investors in that market know our arena very well. They're used to investing in Asia and uh, in Africa. And, and we believe that it is a place where other than getting visibility and access to new, uh, inv a new investor base, we can also increase our liquidity. As far as share price, we're being followed by two investment banks, one in Hong Kong, one in London. Their projections for the short term, which they qualify as 12 to 18 months, is for the stock still has a potential of more than doubling, arriving to 1.4 up to 1.7 pounds per share, which is more than double from where we are today. Um, you mentioned earlier um, about the price quadrupling um, over the past year, um, because obviously due to supply and demand, where do you see that price going over the, the next few years? It's a very, uh, it's difficult uh, to project. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, we're selling at $2,500 per ton, and that is before Chinese New Year. After Chinese uh, New Year, I believe it is growing, it will grow. But today, we already have exceeded our projections for 2027, and I believe it will still continue. So for the next several years, it should only be uh, going upwards. Okay. Um, and lastly, as a conclusion, um, just wondering if you can tell us the outlook for the next 12 to 18 months for, for you guys. So we are, our main goals in the short term for the next 12 months is to continue with our growth. So to grow the volume of extraction, we're testing a minefield unit as we speak in order to identify which is the best equipment in order to do our own in-house mining and drastically reduce the costs. Once we have done, then we will bring it up and scale. That's something we should be doing this year. Uh, we also should be able uh, to grow uh, the volumes and start with production of, of Rutile and Ilmenite. Okay, Oliver, really appreciate your time um, in obviously educating our audience. And as you mentioned, um, in the beginning, it's it's a critical element that is needed, um, obviously mentioned in Australia. So really appreciate um, you educating, educating us and our audience. If our um, listeners want to reach out to you, if they've got any questions um, around, obviously around the company or around um, Zircon, how can they uh, go about uh, contacting you? And, and are you across social media as well? We are, I mean, First, there's a lot of information on our, on our website, uh, both on information of, on our announcements, as well as the research done by the investment banks that follow us. You will find a lot of that at Bloomberg as well, and on both stock exchanges, as far as we have announced. We're present on uh, social media, on, on Instagram and, and LinkedIn, and obviously also using those tools, I'm accessible, uh, I can be accessed through our investor relations and our info. Uh, email, which is on, on, on the different sources of information, easy to find on our website, which is uh, pixresources.com.
Okay. Uh, yeah. We'll include those in the in the show notes as well. So um, really appreciate your time again. Um, hope you enjoyed listening. Um, certainly some um, things to uh, to take away from, from this. Um, as uh, Oliver mentioned, it is a critical element that is needed as we move forward um, going into carbon neutral. So um, appreciate your continued support. Um, and please um, share this episode and obviously tell your friends, family, people about this podcast. Obviously, we want to um, get more and more listeners and educating uh, not just the mining industry, but possibly people outside of the mining industry as well. So appreciate your uh, continued support. So until next time, happy mining. <laughs>